Okay, let's make a start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here today for the double TVS session, TVS 1, TVS 2, and we wish we could have accommodated even more of the contributed talks that were offered to us. Uh, my name is Igor Andreoni, and I will be giving a little introductory talk to TVS um, on behalf of the two co-chairs, who are Sara Bonito in Italy and uh, myself. Um, and uh, before we start, uh, once again, a reminder, please abide to the code of conduct to create respectful, efficient, and healthy uh, scientific work environment. Uh, you can always find in these slides and on the website, the contact of those people to reach out to if you witness or experience any code of conduct violation. And uh, always be mindful of uh, the little helpers on the name tag of people from the color that can indicate their degree of comfort in contact to the social battery. And uh, please keep in mind, at least a couple of cases of COVID have already been reported among the attendees. Uh, and uh, so just be mindful of that and uh, behave the, uh, the way that you find appropriate regarding masking and whatever precaution you would like to take. And as always, as a reminder, also for the people on Zoom, uh, please keep muting during the talks. Feel free to ask questions, preferably on Slack. That would be a much easier way for us to uh, reply and also for everyone to see uh, the, the question and the replies as well. So the Trends and Variable Star Science Collaboration, uh, it, it's pretty big now. It uh, counts more than 560 members, I think, uh, growing fast. The closer we get to T0, since we're T minus uh, one, the, the, the more people want to join and participate our activities. A lot of the information that you will hear today and that you may want to check out if you are interested in joining TVS are on the website. Just Google LSST TVS. It should be pretty straightforward to get there and you will also find there a link for the membership in case you're interested in joining. Uh, this is an outdated map, bottom line, not just where many people, but like pretty much all the science collaborations in Ruby were truly global uh, effort. And uh, it's not just a geographical diversity that we're witnessing here. Uh, people are interested in such a diversity, a variety of science cases. I will refer you to the TVS roadmap. Uh, that's a document that has been posted on archive and peer review uh, in PSP. And uh, that includes a bit of a summary of all or most of the science cases that TVS members are interested and active in. So just a couple of words on the structure of TVS. We are divided in subgroups, which last long, which last for years, and they are mainly uh, science focused, although some subgroups are um, also a bit technical in nature. And we have task forces. Task forces are renewed every year, and they are dedicated to maybe specific problems that arise or are relevant at a given time. And they can be also ranging across multiple science collaborations. Uh, here you have a, just a quick shot of the subgroups. Uh, I will not go through each and every one of them, but once again, you can see how many of the key science cases or classes of science cases are represented from anomalies, supernovae, TDs, uh, galactic sources, microlensing, once again, please check out the website and feel free to reach out especially to the subgroup chair if you're interested in joining their activities. Uh, a recent change since, um, since last year uh, regards in particular the interactive binary subgroup. So last year, uh, just for background, uh, at, the, at the Rubin uh, PCW, uh, we didn't talk a lot about science, but a bit more about organization and reorganization. This change kind of followed that discussion and uh, people 
in the interactive binaries group felt better to be separated into separate group, one for compact binary and one for ellipsoid and the eclipsing binaries. Something else that we encourage is leadership and especially junior leadership, people in their PhD or postdoc phase. So we're happy that uh, uh, Shar Daniels, also this, uh, who's here in the room, decided uh, very kindly volunteered to take on the role of restarting the fast trains in subgroup. And something similar is happening for the transiting exoplanet group that is currently inactive. Uh, well, we're in active conversation in particular with uh, Super Corley and the previous chair, if we managed to actually get in touch, uh, but and uh, try to understand if people are interested in have that as an active group moving forward. And I'm pretty sure that many people here uh, may be or become interested in exoplanets. Similar goes for task forces. Some are truly crucial, uh, probably throughout the, they will be crucial throughout the, um, the survey, such as the crowded field photometer is one of the most active, uh, but they also touch on the survey strategy, uh, everything connected to data preview. And I don't know if Vincenzo is here, who is also uh, chairing uh, this, uh, this subgroup too. Uh, uh, software, so Federica obviously <laughs> remains one of the key people in, uh, in TBS and commissioning and some new task forces again following last year conversation have been proposed uh, this has not yet been extensively discussed decided upon but i i, I thought uh, with sarah to just flesh them out so people are thinking of maybe have task forces on uh, how to do science in the local volume using gaia in uh, synergy with that uh, but massive objects in binaries or advanced sst even engagement with large language model. So how can we teach each other to use like tools like ChatGPT or uh, generative AI to do our science in a better way and uh, or use transfer learning for that. And uh, how do you get involved in task forces? Maybe the easiest way is just check out uh, Slack, the main LSSDC uh, Slack workspace. If you do um, found TVS, you should see all the options coming up and some of them are for the task forces. And once again, just reach out to the people and check the website. Um, I will stop here. We have a pretty rich program today. We truly wanted to already shift gear towards the science since we're so close to the beginning of operations. So all, pretty much all the uh, talks will be uh, very science focused. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that we have uh, reached this milestone. So before uh, we move forward, does anyone have any questions? Uh, Greg, anything from Slack? Okay, but people, please feel free to also uh, write questions like at a later stage, if anything comes to mind that you would like to hear answered. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce now uh, Azali as our first speaker today. Just give me one second to, to switch. So there is only one comment that I have. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, please come to this side of the room, because this is the only part of this big room that is mic. The other side is not, so we have to cross the boundary. Other people speaking, asking in question in person. Okay, so uh, Azali uh, Bostrom, almost close. I will butcher a lot of surnames today. <laughs> Apologies in advance. I uh, will tell us about exploiting the uh, synergy of LSST with time domain surveys to study the early evolution of explosive transients. And just before starting to all the speakers, uh, indicated a bit longer time slot, up to nine minutes. Please stick to it. I will show the two minutes mark uh, when it's done. Okay, I'll do my Take best. It away. Thank you. Um, so yes, I wanna talk to you about the super long title, uh, basically how we can use some time domain uh, surveys in addition to LSST to fill in some of the gaps in the observations. This is work I'm doing as an LSST DA Catalyst Fellow at University of Arizona, and it's 
I'm going to be talking a lot about the DLT40 survey and collaboration, so this is uh, work coming from them as well. So I wanted to start off as kind of the first talk with what I think are the most relevant things to know about LSST and the cadence and kind of how observing is gonna work for time domain. So the first thing is we're gonna have an image. It's gonna be a 30 second integration time, most likely. I should say all of this is subject to change. This is just the most likely current plan. Uh, so within 30, 60 seconds, an alert will be issued for anything that has a change from the template with signal to noise that's greater than five. Um, a second image will be taken about 30 minutes later in a different filter. Um, and then for about 4% of the observations, there will be a third image in the night. Um, I think that's a couple hours later. The next image isn't gonna be for two to four days, depending on where the field falls in the rolling cadence. So that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of what types of light curves we'll get from LSST alone. Um, so when I think about LSST for supernova science, I come from the massive star supernova community. And so some of the things that I'm really excited about learning are what happens in the final years of a massive star's life. So here is a light curve of a, of a couple different supernovae. Well, where it goes up really bright around time zero, that's the supernova itself. But you can see some of these objects are detected before and there's variability. We think some of this could be explosive outbursts, but then we have a lot that have limits that are even lower than these outbursts. And we don't really know um, what's going on. Are those just fainter? Are they not doing anything? Um, and these are gonna be our LSST single images down here. So you can see that we're gonna get a much more complete picture of this. And with this 10 year baseline, we can look at what's going on. Um, we can also find out what does the very early evolution of the supernova look like. We'll be getting these very deep light curves out to much greater distances. And so there will be some supernova that we catch in their very infant, infant phase. And I think the trick is going to be identifying these objects and then filling in, you know, this very rapid rise time where kind of hours to days really matter. Um, and then what I also think is really interesting, what does a supernova look like years after explosion? We usually stop following these after one or two years, but uh, it could be they rebrighten and we just aren't looking there. So I think that's another really interesting thing um, that I'm excited about. Um, but I think that with this data set comes some challenges. And the biggest, one of the biggest challenges to me is identifying what is an interesting object when it happens. So not like after the fact, looking at the light curve, but if you really wanna know how that light curve rises or something, you need to have identified it from the first image um, or maybe with that 30, uh, the 30 minute cadence image. So um, the ways that we currently think about this and that our team vets things is first we look at what's the absolute magnitude that requires some kind of host association um, that might be in the alert. My hope is it's in the alert, but I, and I know that a different brokers are figuring out how to do that, but whether that'll be available on this half hour timescale, I think is still an open question. Um, also figuring out what does it mean to rise rapidly if you only have observations separated by 30 minutes. This is a very recent example that Manish Ashley published of Supernova 2024 GGI. Um, the orange is R band and the blue is G band. And so I've marked in different colors what that half hour separation looks like in different filters. And you can see we're not, see, even though both light curves are rising, both filters are rising, there's not a rise between these two filters. But then, you know, three hours later, they're about the same brightness. And then a few hours later, you're starting to see this rise. So we need a really, really good understanding of the color evolution of early objects, which I don't think we have because we haven't really been observing kind of the zoo of transients this early and in this much detail. So, um, another challenge I think is just gonna be cadence. This is what a four day cadence looks like. Here um, I'm showing the color, B minus B color um, as light curve for supernova 2024 GGI. This is a massive star supernova. Here I'm showing what the U band light curve looks like for 2017 CBD. This is a thermonuclear supernova. And this is with a four day cadence. So this is kind of worst case scenario. Um, we can fill in what if this was the two day cadence, we would get these points, but you can still see that that's nothing compared to the data sets that we can get with other facilities. So I'm really thinking about how do we leverage these other surveys to, to maybe, you know, we identify it here and then we can get all of these other data points. 
Um, so we've been doing this to some degree with the DLT40 survey. This is the distance less than 40 megaparsecs survey. So we're looking for supernova within 40 megaparsecs targeting galaxies. We look at about a thousand galaxies per night and discover about 15 supernova per year within a day of explosion. We're using uh, 0.4 meter Skynet telescopes. This gives us telescopes in Australia, Chile, and Canada. So we're in both hemispheres and we have a 12 hour cadence in the Southern hemisphere. Um, our discoveries are made public immediately. If you were following TNS last night, we reported a new supernova. Um, they're coming fat rapidly. Um, but the idea is just we want everyone to follow these up. This is not something that we're trying to keep proprietary. Um, and we've been running since 2017. So we now have a 17 or sorry, a seven year baseline. Um, down to a magnitude, 19th magnitude in R. Um, and our teams are uh, kind of distributed around different observatories and universities and even countries at this point. Um, so one of the things, I know this came up in the broker se uh, session, is that we are trying to automate as much as possible to remove the requirement for human vetting. So our observ we have an observing queue. We're not having uh, one person submit you know, each observation. We can choose what we prioritize in this queue. So one of the things we prioritize because we want to understand these really early light curves are a test field. So any um, galaxy that is in TESS's current observing field gets a higher priority. And this is something that you can imagine doing with LSST as well, either prioritizing fields that were just observed or that are about to be observed with LSST. Um, we also have an automated reduction pipeline. We have a machine learning algorithm that issues a score um, and gives our team alerts for anything that has a high machine learning score. Um, and we've recently implemented the automatic triggering of a confirmation image. And if it's there in the confirmation image, we'll trigger multiband photometry at a high cadence and spectroscopy automatically to classify it. So we actually just practiced this last night. It went very well. Um, and so we're, this is now kind of our current era of, you know, how do we get from discovery to classification uh, without human intervention? Um, the other thing that we've done is more and more all sky surveys have come online and more and more things are getting issued, more and more supernovae are getting reported to the transient name server is we now look at any reported supernova that was in our field of view, we identify it and then we search to see if we had um, pre-discovery images of that field, maybe more limits, and then we can also continue to follow those. Um, and then with this, kind of one of the things that we found to be important is to know when the last non-detection was and how much it rose between that last non-detection and the first detection. That helps us identify that it's really an interesting young supernova. So how I see these working with LSST, I think LSST is gonna be great at early detection. It's so much deeper than we're currently going. We have this long, deep long-term baseline monitoring to tell us both about the progenitor before it explodes and the supernova after. Um, it should also tell us information about like just looking at the SED of the progenitor, was it a red supergiant, a yellow supergiant, a blue supergiant, you know, nothing was there, maybe it was a low mass binary or something. Um, and we're gonna have this huge statistical sample that we can start to do analyses on and looking at things out to higher redshift. Um, but I think that DLT-40 can come in and other time domain surveys can come in and prioritize observations in the LSST footprint. Um, this can provide limits if we're observing before LSST um, or provide uh, information on a rapid rise if we're observing after LSST. Um, we can also uh, provide high cadence multiband observations so we can um, kind of fill in that early light curve until until we get onto kind of a boring plateau or something like that. Um, and then we can also provide a gold sample for the characterization of this large statistical sample that we have with LSST. Um, so this is my last slide. I wanted to leave you with my summary. I think LSST strengths are its depth, kind of the long-term status that we have and the statistics that we can gain from it. But it, one of its weaknesses is its cadence. So time domain surveys like DLT-40 have strengths of cadence and wavelength coverage that are very complementary to LSST. Um, and again, their weaknesses are this depth and field of view, which LSST complements very well. So I think if we combine these two surveys, um, we can gain this full history of the transient um, with 
the whole red supergiant progenitor, detailed observations of the supernova itself, as well as the long-term light curve, um, and robust statistics on different types of supernovae. Um, and I'm hoping that with, with all of this information, we can robustly connect supernovae to their different progenitor systems. Thank you. Any question? Um, could you, anyone sitting in that side of the room, when they ask question, if they can please come closer, this is where the microphones are. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Can you say something about typical exposure times? And you know, if uh, Ruben finds an interesting supernova, what kind of cadence would you find yourself wanting to do with DLT-40? We're talking about once every 10 minutes, once every hour. I don't have a sense of that. Yeah, so right. We actually had this debate last night. I think we were doing every 15 minutes. Um, and because we're going down to magnet 19th magnitude, we're not doing super long exposures. Um, so we can get that pretty quickly. Um, I think that one of the questions and, and maybe things that different surveys can complement our different surveys have different limiting magnitudes. So, you know, if LSST detects something at 25th magnitude, uh, DLT-40 is not gonna be able to follow that up for, I don't know, a day or something like that, maybe a couple days, uh, but maybe something like DECAM can fill in that intermediate time or identify the rise or something like that. So I think that there's, uh, hopefully we can work together as a community to build like a comprehensive data set rather than trying to, each go after our, our own survey and, and uh, maybe duplicate effort. Um, we can take one more question. Go Tom. Go Tom was, uh, from uh, Zoom. Hey, Azmi, great talk. Um, so in all of this, DLT-40 is operating along with LS4 in the South with the Young Supernova experiment and other surveys going on at the same time. Is there a plan to actually make DLT-40 alerts public along with the Rubin data stream so people can combine the observations to, to actually uh, get the US cadence? So there's a, still so, this notion that the DLT-40 thing is basically a private survey. Let's see, anything that we confirm, we make public. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that there's I don't think that there's any reason we couldn't make our full alert stream public if you like where people would have access to the machine learning score and any interesting transient. I would just say it's not a very pure stream at this point. But any anything we discover that's real that we get a confirmation image of, we report. Thank you. And uh, let's thank Hazel again. there were more questions, I encourage you to write them on Slack if uh, they're pressed. So the uh, next speaker, um, Rajatka, um, oh, is the speaker? Been... Oh, yes. Okay. Let me stop sharing here. Yeah. Hey, could you please share your slides? Yeah. Uh, just give me a minute. Um, can you confirm if the slides are visible? Yes, well, good. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I will not be able to switch on the video because I'm at a limited uh, bandwidth here. I hope that's okay. Yes, it's all good. And uh, yeah. Project will tell us about strategies to identify strongly lens type 1 supernova in Rubin LSST. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, hello, everyone. I am Prasakta. I recently graduated with the master's uh, from Azumohali. And uh, today I'm going to present a bit of work that uh, we are doing with Anuprita and Surod on uh, different strategies to identify strongly lens type and a supernova in the LSST data. So just to give a brief overview of uh, why we are looking at uh, lens type and a supernova, uh, which essentially brings us to the field of time delay cosmography where uh, we see that the 
uh, strong lensing time delays are uh, inversely proportional to Hubble constant, uh, which means that if we have accurate measurements of time delays and estimates of surface mass distribution of the lens and the redshift of the lens and the source, we can it can serve as a method to constrain Hubble constant. And the time delay cosmography has primarily so far been done with quasars, but uh, uh, type 1 supernovae could be a better source for uh, yeah. these measurements because of their well-studied light curves and their transient and standard candle natures. Um, and LSST is expected to detect uh, a lot of such uh, lensed SN1A events, uh, which bring me brings me to the topic of how we are going about finding these uh, lensed SN1A. Uh, and we are exploring two methods here. First is a uh, First is we are trying to run the standard uh, difference imaging pipeline on um, a simulated data set. And the next is to analyze the color magnitude space um, uh, to find out if the lensed SN1A occupy a specific space in the color magnitude uh, space for transients and to see if that could be a, a good uh, way of identifying lens type in supernovae. So uh, this slide gives a brief overview of the data that we're using for difference imaging analysis. And the sky data for this comes from raw exposures of Subaru HSC data. We are using, um, currently we are using 149 visits in five different bands. And um, the, the data set is processed using this version of LSST pipeline. Uh, in this process data, uh, we have injected the simulated lensed images, strongly lensed images um, of type 1 supernovae. Um, the strong lensing simulations, as well as the uh, light class simulations for uh, lens supernovae both have been done using a code that was developed in house and uh, you can ask more questions about the details if you uh, if you want to know something in more details um, and just to give a preliminary uh, result, so the work is still ongoing and uh, I can what I'm showing here are the preliminary results. Uh, so on the left side, you can see the template image and the science image for the injections. And on the right side, there is the difference image that we have observed. So just to point, uh, just point to note here is that you don't see a foreground galaxy in the difference images or in any of the uh, in the in the science image, for example, or in the template image, you don't see a foreground galaxy uh, because um, uh, this is a set. Uh, this is a different set of um, uh, images that I had uh, run difference imaging on for the sake of visual representation. Because when there is a galaxy in the foreground, um, it becomes slightly difficult for uh, Naked eyes to be able to detect the difference between the naked uh, between the template image and the science image. So, for the sake of visual representation, um, there there are no galaxies in the foreground. But the actual data uh, that I am processing uh, has the galaxies in the foreground, which um, which are which are essentially the lens galaxies. So that is one point to uh, note. Uh, so here in the upper 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 part, what you see is the case of unresolved cords. Um, so so the red circles here uh, is the detected dia sources, so the sources that have been detected by difference imaging, uh, and the yellow circles is the location of the injections that I had made. And uh, as you can see in the unresolved cords case, I had injected four images um, of one system, but the pipeline could only recover it as a one single source. In the middle, what you see is the case of resolved doubles, where uh, two images or a cord or a double system was uh, injected and the pipeline could detect both of the images. Whereas in the bottom um, uh, corner, there is a case of unresolved doubles. So uh, this was a visual representation, but to give some uh, statistics. Uh, so the first table gives numbers related to um, how many, um, how many, uh, so the pipeline could detect um, dia sources for how many injections is the first table essentially. And what you see here is um, we get approximately 70% recovery in the first run of uh, a different imaging pipeline. Uh, and here the recovery is slightly higher for cords, uh, cord systems and the recovery goes down as we go from uh, R band to Y band and the recovery uh, is like, it drops significantly for the Y band. Uh, now, uh, looking at the numbers of how many systems the pipeline could actually resolve, the numbers are slightly less impressive. Um, and what we see here is the most of the injections were detected as unresolved by the pipeline, whereas uh, very few uh, injections uh, the pipeline was actually able to resolve. So uh, I am not putting the plot here for the sake of time, but if you see an, a plot, another plot that I have in results, um, 
that plot essentially says that uh, this resolved uh, resolved fraction it depends it depends on the angular separation in the system so the higher the angular separation uh, i see more resolved fraction which is uh, what we are what we expect um, and uh, the another point to note here is that we're not putting any lower cutoff on the angular separations of the systems that we had injected in the first run because we were just trying out few things. And uh, because of this uh, reason, uh, this very low resolved fraction um, can kind of be explained. And this is something that we are working on um, in the future runs of the dye pipeline. Uh, we have kept this in mind. Uh, now going to the color magnitude analysis. So uh, this criteria was originally proposed uh, in Quimby et al. 2014, where uh, what they were what they had essentially proposed is the use of color magnitude space to identify lens type one a supernovae. And what this diagram or what this plot uh, says is that the redder supernovae for a given I band magnitude, um, they are more likely to be the cases of lens type one a supernovae uh, rather than um, the 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 uh, the transients which are on the bluer side at the same I band magnitude. And this criteria they had given for unresolved photometry on rising phase of the light curve. We wanted to explore this criteria further for more cases of uh, supernova properties. Um, so we plotted similar color magnitude diagrams uh, from the supernova or the simulated type in a supernova data set that we had had. And in the upper, upper a panel, the two upper panels that you see here are uh, designated as low Z. So here the low Z means uh, uh, from redshift 0 to 1.6 uh, approximately, whereas for high Z, it is from 1.6 to 3 redshift. Uh, what we noted here is that the color, the R minus I versus I uh, color magnitude diagram uh, works uh, great in separating the lens and unlensed type in a supernovae for low Z band. And uh, we propose the use of Z minus Y and Y band magnitude um, for um, for supernovae higher than redshift 1.6. And um, so what, what we see here in each of the four panels is that the black bold curve is able to uh, distinguish between the lensed uh, supernovae and the unlensed supernovae, both on the rising and falling edges. Uh, we also check for the contamination from core collapse supernovae in uh, this space. Um, so here, what you see is the unlensed core collapse supernovae, which are designated as dark green points. They have very, they, they do very less contamination in the space that uh, we saw was occupied by lens type and supernovae. So the contamination from unlensed core collapse supernovae was found to be negligible. To check um, if, if any specific type of uh, core collapse supernovae are contaminating uh, this space, I further plotted the lensed core collapse part into uh, separated into different types of like six types of core collapse supernovae. And what I see here is that the major contamination comes from um, type 1b and 1c, lensed 1b and 1c um, core collapse supernovae. So uh, summary of the work so far is that in, in, in one of the first runs of, uh, type, uh, of the dia pipeline, it recovers about 70% of the injected information and uh, the recovery fraction is uh, it is it is seen to be fainter for injected uh, for fainter injected systems it is slightly higher for quads and it decreases very significantly for y band we also observed a very low resolved fraction which could be explained in some way um, but it was also seen to be correlated with the angular separation of the systems and the color magnitude uh, criteria it's it seemed to be um, well selecting the lens type one supernovae for both simulated and we also uh, try to do it on observed data uh, and it works quite well on observed data as well both on the rising and falling edges and the contamination from unlensed core collapse supernova is very low whereas the primary contaminants were found to be lens core collapse 1b and 1c's and um, this is these are some of the things that we are still working on um, uh, which is like studying extendedness of unresolved systems uh, to see if they can be used as a marker. Um, we also plan to incorporate LSST cadence. Currently, the cadence using uh, current cadence in use is HST cadence. And we also plan to uh, run it on DC2 data in future runs. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. I have one question. Yeah. 
If nobody has any, may I ask a question? Yeah, uh, sure. Can you uh, just say a few words about why you think that these systems, these systems are not detected by the pipeline? Uh, uh, could you repeat the question? Why uh, I couldn't get Why the uh, these sources are not detected by the pipeline? What's the main reason? Uh, so, you're, are you talking about the 70% uh, recovery or the resolved? Uh, the 70% recovery, yes. Right, right. Uh, so, so we had put a limit of 26 magnitude when we were injecting. So, uh, any any source which had magnitude greater than 26, we were rejecting. But 26 is still um, very faint magnitude for a single epoch uh, uh, injections. So one reason might be that that uh, very faint uh, uh, systems were getting rejected. So I have another plot that might help explain this better. Um, so if you see the top plot, um, that basically says that uh, the okay, wait, I am so sorry. Yeah, so the top plot essentially uh, is showing that uh, the recovery fraction is decreasing very significantly and very drastically it drops after a certain magnitude. So uh, our guess is that that is the main reason that we need to um, uh, inject more uh, brighter uh, systems. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to the speaker again. Oh, there's no light. You cannot hear me? Um, so I will be talking about a few different infrastructures that we are building and which will be very useful once uh, LST, LSST will be coming online. So I will start with two different focus in science cases, which are two major things from the TBS working group. The first being gravitational wave follow-up or kilonova. And here is this an example of different model you have, but how quickly the light curve or the evolution of kilonova is. And we are very interested in building infrastructure so that we can do very rapid follow-up and to characterize this. But with GW follow-up, another um, challenge is localization and getting the candidate as quickly as we can. So in order to work on this, we have this collaboration called saguaro. So saguaro, if you don't know, are these huge cactuses, very common in Arizona. And so we have this collaboration between University of Arizona and Northwestern University, and these are a few of the members. And what we do is we have built this infrastructure using Tom Toolkit, where you have this I don't think the laser is working. Okay, so what we have is we have this infrastructure where there are different things. So the first portion is searching for the candidate. So you have this localization from the GW candidates, right? All those different tiles are showing which are possible uh, sky localization and the different color indicates different surveys that are saying, oh, there could be a candidate or what they are observing. This is kind of like tracer map if you have used it, but you can have this nice overlay. And the white one is the CSS Catalina sky survey that we use. So it is saying where we are pointing and what we are observing. And then in addition to that, we get things like candidate filtering and we get different imaging where we are looking for these candidates to begin with. Once you have candidate, you can imagine there are a lot of things. We have to characterize it and figure out if this is an actual candidate or not, and we should follow up so that we don't use a lot of our very precious resources trying to follow up every candidate. And in order to do that, we have this different um, infrastructure already in place. So we have a lot of catalogs that we have in our directory, and we have something like running a vetting tool. So we map cross match with different catalogs to see if these are stars, what kind of objects it could be. And also we can do possible host galaxy association. So you have a sense like what kind of distance it is and if these are interesting to follow up. 
once you have all of this, we also have this place where you have this beautiful photometry where we collect data from things like GC and TNS and different kinds of resources. And we put it together to see, could this be a Kilonova candidate and should we follow it up or not? So this infrastructure is in place. We have been trying to use it. So you can imagine once LSSD is on, you will have different candidates that we can bet through this process and decide if we want to do a follow-up observation or not. Another science case we are very interested, and Azali really talked about it quite a bit already, is young supernova. And this is just a beautiful image of very young supernova, very close by 24 GDI. And what we are interested as a group is, at least what I am interested in, is understanding the mass loss history of these massive stars towards the very final stage. So as we know, a like, lot of massive stars are losing mass throughout its lifetime. Now, this mass loss creates circumstellar material. These massive stars explode as a supernova. This ejecta from this supernova can interact with the circumstellar material. And at very initial phase, it can have these flash features that is indicating that there was some kind of CSM interaction. And here, I'm just talking about regular type 2, and I'm not talking about the special type 2N, where we know this interaction happens. But we are getting more and more that these kind of things are happening, even for regular type 2 supernova. We see these flash features, but it lasts for a very short period of time. So we want to get there early. So if you have LSST discovery of supernova, we want to follow up quickly, get a spectra. As we already saw this play plot, but also in light curve, you can have signature of the CSM interaction. And we see this blue word evolution, which is again indicating there is CSM interaction. And we want to know this. Now, a lot of supernova are being detected, a lot of them. But the classification and the follow-up is very, very limited, you can see in the blue. And this will get exaggerated when you have LSST. We will be discovering so many supernova, but following it up is very difficult. Now, there are different approaches how you want to do it and your science goal. But coming for us, we are more interested in having maybe few follow-up, but having a very good data set. So we have this gold standard with like limited number of supernova that we follow up with very high cadence and good data so that we have much better handle in the physics. And in order to do so, we have a few different programs. Like we have gotten some Gemini time for a large and long proposal for next six semesters so we can follow up a lot of young supernova and get very good data set. We have a rapid TO program and where we can Telescope at the University of Arizona that we can interface with this cube. Any interesting transient with click of a button. So if you have used MMT, you know, like while you are trying to a lot of steps you have to go through, and we are trying some kind of package so that we to the telescope without going through steps. And this is where pi MMT comes. And this is a very simple flow chart for pi MMT. So for any kind of survey, once LSST comes online, for example, we use a lot of DLT40. And so once there is any interesting transient, we can create finder chart, a request, an observation. And the way we have set it up is that it gets placed as a TO in MMT, but we don't overtake any other observation. We wait for any observation happening to finish, and then the observer can go to our observation. Uh, we get the data in real time, so we can do reduction on the same night we are getting the data. So hopefully, we can. Um, do reduction and then classification. So these are very important when we are trying to do a rapid follow-up. And we have used this uh, thing and integrated in few user interface things. So when I say it is very easy, it is, for example, for the Saguaro Tom, we have implemented this program such that depending on your science case, so this SASE broker is more in tune towards supernova search, sorry, supernova follow-up, and Saguaro is more for GW. So what we do is that if you click on the target you want to observe, you actually get 
almost everything filled out for you so that at night when you are tired and you're trying to follow up, you don't make much mistake. So once you click on the button, it actually goes for the observation and you can get a very quick follow-up, spectroscopic follow-up. So this is the infrastructure we have been building on. So this is my last slide. So I guess I have told you how important rapid follow-up is and why it is so needed, especially now with LSST coming online. We want to have uh, rapid follow-up of any interesting transient. And hopefully with the thing we have developed, which is right now just for MMT, but MMT is a Q-based observatory. So hopefully these packages can be used in other observatories where Q-based is already in place, then this uh, kind of Python packages can be implemented and used in future. And also hopefully Sagoro Tom can be used uh, for other general community as well. Thank you. Any questions for Manisha? There's one here. Should I read it? Please. Um, thanks for answering my question live. Um, understood about the magnitude limit that oh, reduces sorry. completeness. That's my question to the previous speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> my apologies. Just a few okay. so. We appreciate your enthusiasm. Yes. <laughs> so. I have one question. So it was really great flow to follow up the interesting transient. And did you really uh, apply this flow to the real case? Yes. And is there any good news from that? Oh yeah. So so I really focused on um, infrastructure, but like using this uh, using this, we have had like where we got like MMT spectra within like few hours after discovery. And we were able to get this, um, I don't know how interested you are, but like this ledge feature, which is very hard to get in earlier spectra. And we were able to get that and um, get more about this CSM interaction, which is not as, um, um, it's not like a flash spectra, but it is a uh, different kind of, but it gives you information about CSM interaction. So we have used this for also the brightest GRV uh, and got some data from that. Thank you, great. One more question. So when you decide the uh, targets you want to follow up, what are the criteria? How do you, can you tell those targets are interesting or uh, using MMT? So uh, for MMT, um, so until last semester, we had, uh, I had a program where I was interested in, one was gamma rivers. I'm very interested in following up gamma rivers. Uh, we are very interested in type two with class features. So you have like, say, if there is a discovery, basically, if there is a discovery of a young supernova, and if it is Tentatively, we are like DLT 40, so less than 40 megaparsec. We tend to follow them up. And especially if there is a flash spectra, for example, then we do follow them up. But anything that is interesting and close by, we try to follow them. Oh, so this is after someone else already identified targets as a supernovae or GRP. Once, yeah, like, like the surveys, once survey finds some interesting things. Let's thank Manish again. Okay, so, so my I stopped sharing. Uh, do you want to start sharing from your laptop? Okay. So the next speaker um, is uh, Sumaya Kakpash and will tell us about multi-filter UV to near-infrared data-driven light curve templates for script envelope supernova. Take it away. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for giving me this opportunity. I'm Samaya Kakwash. I'm an LSSCDA uh, Calvis Fellow at Rutgers. And uh, as we uh, all know, for surveys like ZTF and LSSD, um, in the era of these surveys, um, 
we won't have uh, enough instruments to be able to follow up all of the transients that these surveys find every night and be able to classify them based on their spe spectra. So it's really important to uh, have um, to, to focus on the photometric classification of the transients for these uh, services, especially LSSD, uh, with the amount of data uh, that it will provide. So for this purpose, and in order to help uh, better understand the photometric evolution of less studies types of supernovae, in this case, it's cheap almost supernovae, we have um, created multi-filter data-driven light care, photometric light cares for these uh, types of supernovae. So these are core collapse supernovae that for some reasons have been stripped of their uh, either uh, helium or hydrogen or both of these uh, envelopes. So in this talk, I will um, I will tell you like how we choose our sample, how we create these templates, and I will talk about how we actually use these templates to study uh, like different aspects of these supernovae. So the the main resource where we get uh, these. Uh, supernovae from is the open supernova catalog, which unfortunately is not being maintained anymore, but the data is over there online. So what we do is that uh, we select uh, um, SNE of types 1C, 1B, 2B, 1CBL, 1B, and 1BN. And we require that uh, these supernovae at least uh, have one published spectra and have at least five data points, uh, photometric data points in one band, and that we can find the uh, time of the peak uh, from their data. As you can see on the right here, we have three examples of three supernovae. The, on the top, we have a very well sampled supernovae uh, 93J. We have like, a, we're, we're basically showing how much their, uh, what is like the range of photometric coverage in our sample. So, um, so what we have, what we select from the open supernova catalog, we end up, uh, we ended up adding some more individual uh, supernovae to the sample, which uh, in total is is 165 stripped on the supernovae. Uh, in this plot here, you can see on the top panel the. Blue shows what all the strip on the supernovae that have photometry on the open supernova catalog. And the red one is the sample that we get from there. And, um, and on the bottom, we can see the, all, all the SNE uh, of strip on uh, supernovae discovered uh, that have at least 10 photometric data points. And we can see the discovery, day, uh, discovery year on the uh, bottom. So, so in this diagram here, I'm just going to uh, show you step by step what we do to create these templates. You can see the details in the paper, but I'm going to give you an overview of that. So on the left side, this is where I just explained where we get the data, how we get it from the open supernova catalog, and the criteria that we set plus some individual assignment that we add to the sample. In the next step, for each filter, we create an, a sort of average a template, which we call the 1BC template. And we, use, we create that using uh, a rolling median to aggregate all the uh, supernovae in that filter. Uh, the reason we do that is that we want to subtract that median template, the 1BC template, from individual supernovae. You can see here uh, in this example, um, that we have the supernovae, we have the average uh, or median supernovae uh, template, uh, which we call it the 1BC template. We subtract it, then we fit a Gaussian processes to the residual to uh, basically be able to get the evolution of the supernovae compared to that uh, average uh, template. And then once we get the GP fit, we have uh, GP fits for individual supernova, and finally we aggregate all those GP uh, fits to find uh, to get the final GP templates. So we have a total of fifty-four data-driven photometric templates. You can see them here for uh, in filters and for subtypes where we have enough data, we we can create these templates. And you can see the evolution here. So some highlights about these templates: um, we fit the Gaussian processes in the log time to better capture the early changes in the light curves. We also uh, optimize the ga Gaussian processes fit by adjusting an objective function and, uh, and get a smoother fits um, 
for the for each individual uh, supernovae. And what, when we compare these different uh, templates, we find that overall the photometric behavior of the different subtypes of this type are consistent within the uncertainty region of each other. But we also find that in uh, SNE2B, we see the shock cooling emission in the early um, uh, phases of this supernova that stands out from the other subtypes. And then uh, we also find that the uh, SNE1CBL tend to have a faster declines uh, in some of the bands compared to the other uh, templates. We can see it in our eye, in, uh, eye here. And so now that we have these uh, templates, we're able to uh, basically um, like a, a study these parametric behavior in different ways. So one thing we do is that we compare individual supernovae that are either known as prototypical supernovae of some type, subtype or uh, supernovae that have unusual spectroscopic behavior. We want to look at their photometric evolution and see how that uh, compares with the templates. For instance, this is for a uh, type 1C that I'm showing here. We have uh, SN94I, uh, which is uh, usually known as a prototypical uh, 1C in the literature. And we can see it's, uh, it's in color uh, brown here. We can see that it's actually uh, evolving much faster than the templates, and it doesn't seem like to be a typical 1C. And we, uh, we also compared the other types, uh, one, one, the other individual SNE, what we find is that unusual spectroscopy behavior does not necessarily end up um, showing up in the photometric evolution of the <laughs> and uh, so since I mentioned um, photometric classification, we have the two famous elastic and plastic uh, LCC data sets. And we wanted to see if the, uh, the simulations for this type of supernovae in, the, in that data set, um, how, how that compares with our template. So we compare, here we're comparing our templates, the 1B and 1BN templates with the uh, 1B uh, simulated light curves in elastic. And uh, you can see the simulations <laughs> in black data points, but we also see the per day median uh, median of the simulations in, in the pink diamonds here. And we can see that the per day median is pretty much consistent with the 1B templates that we have, but we don't really have a lot of representatives uh, for 1B ends in the elastic data set. But we, but we also see some, like a number, a significant number <laughs> of slow evolving uh, 1Bs that are not consistent with the template that we have. And um, when we do this for uh, one Cs, we find pretty much a similar results, but we see that in the early phases, we're seeing a faster evolution in the simulations compared to our templates. Again, we see much faster or much slower uh, evolution in the simulations uh, compared to the uh, templates. So this, um, we, we just know that even though like most of these simulations uh, are consistent with our, uh, with our template, we find that like uh, these numbers of like a slower evolving or faster evolving could be um, problematic when we're doing photometric uh, classification. And then finally, we also look at uh, some of the rapid evolving ZTF supernovae from the um, Anahos 2023 paper. We wanted to see, since these uh, supernovae were uh, known for their rapid evolution, we wanted to check and see if they're also um, showing up as rapid um, evolving supernovae compared to our templates, which uh, pretty much most of them are much faster evolving than, than the template. One thing we find is that for two of these um, supernovae, 2B supernovae, uh, strip uh, envelope supernovae, we find that it's on the top. Um, we find that uh, 
they're actually, uh, when we look at the second peak and align that with the templates, they appear to be normal. But uh, since the first peak was the focus of that paper, they appear to be rapid uh, evolving uh, supernovae. And we emphasize the importance of uh, distinguishing the evolution of early peaks uh, to better understand the physical process uh, that is leading to the rapid evolution. And with that, I end my talk. Thank you so much for listening. Any questions from the room? So um, you you mentioned kind of that some of our prototypical supernovae are not normal, and I I totally agree. I think often prototypical meant best studied, and that doesn't mean you know now that we have larger samples. I'm wondering. Um, you mentioned a few examples, but like, was that a common theme in all of the prototypical or were those the ones that maybe we should be cautious of, but there were a lot of prototypical ones that are still, you know, uh, pretty prototypical or? Uh, so for the ones that we checked, uh, the 94 I was the only one that like particularly stands out and as not being typical. But um, there are like examples where like we see maybe differences in the early rise or like the later declines, but 94i was like particularly standing out throughout the whole uh, phase. Uh, do you use a, a, a it's not how Gaussian processes phrase this, but effectively there's some different time scale of expected visibility from this physical process, right? Like day one, things might happen on our time scales, but in day 40, nothing interesting is happening on an hour time scale. Do you explicitly use or look at that kind of information? You Sorry, you talked about smoothing in some sense, and I was curious how you thought about that for doing the Gaussian process. So, um, so we do two things that I mentioned. One is that we do the uh, Gaussian process fit in the log time that allows to uh, better fit the early features that are like um, happening faster. That's one thing, but uh, there's also this um, um, artifact that happens with the Gaussian processes where uh, depending on what the kernel, what, what the kernel is you're feeding uh, and what the process <clears throat> is, um, in, in some of the cases, it tends to kind of like overfit and go through all the data points. And in order to be consistent for, for all of the uh, individual supernovae, we add uh, a regularization term to the objective function to uh, basically um, prevent that overfeeding and have a smoother um, fit for pretty much all of the supernovae in the sample. Thank you. We can take one more question. I see Mariam has a hands up on Zoom. Uh, yeah, so this is more uh, answering uh, Azali's question since I'm a co-author on this paper. Um, so this is Mariam Maja. So um, one thing that is important about this prototypical object, which was, you know, 94i, um, it's actually a very similar object to this growing group of rapid evolving supernovae that Anna Ho and others have worked on and that, you know, there was a huge conference uh, work, think shop in Bormio. Uh, so this is, you know, as you know, a very interesting field um, that we, we should reassess, you know, kind of these new objects with what we know. So that's all I wanted to mention. Thanks. Thank you, Mario. And thank you, Sumaya. All right, so the next speaker is uh, Riley Clark, who's going to tell us about how every data point counts and how atmosphere can help us study transits. Thanks, Igor. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Riley Clark. I'm a PhD student at the University of Delaware, and I'm going to talk about stellar flares, uh, what they will look like in uh, what they will look like in Rubin, and how we can use atmospheric refraction as a tool to do stellar flare science with the uh, wealth of data that Rubin will provide. 
Okay, so stellar flares are stochastic bursts of electromagnetic radiation that occur when magnetic field lines on stars reconnect and accelerate charged particles into the photosphere. Um, and the emission can range from the radio to the soft X-ray. Uh, they occur most commonly on low mass stars with convective envelopes, um, and they can be used as tracers of stellar magnetism. Um, and additionally, the ultraviolet emission from flares has a dramatic impact on exoplanet atmospheres. Um, so they are very relevant to uh, habitability studies. Uh, photometrically, uh, stellar flares uh, are characterized by a rapid initial rise followed by a slower uh, decay phase in the brightness. Um, and the time scale of the uh, stellar flares is short compared to most survey cadences. Uh, typical flare will evolve on a time scale of minutes to hours. And while the photometric morphology of flares has been um, very well characterized by um, uh, observatories like Kepler and TESS, um, the evolution of the temperature of the flaring region um, has been uh, less characterized in contrast. Uh, most flare studies assume that the, uh, that the continuum emission is a fixed black body temperature of around 10,000 Kelvin, uh, but that would underestimate the ultraviolet flux of a 30,000 Kelvin flare by a factor of 16. Um, and to date, there have been relatively few uh, color temperature measurements of super flares. One of the largest samples I'm showing a subset of over here on the right, um, where they, uh, the authors used simultaneous uh, tests and every scope observations to uh, make flare temperature profiles of 47 uh, super flares. So based on uh, flare rates in SDSS, we can predict that Rubin will detect between point four and 1.4 flares per image. Um, and over the 10-year wide fast deep, um, that will uh, lead to millions of flare detections over the 10-year baseline. Um, the deep drilling fields will enable traditional flare studies. Um, we can expect uh, somewhere on the order of hundreds of flare detections per field. Uh, but the data volume of the wide fast deep opens up the possibility for population level studies of stellar flare and stellar flare temperatures. However, due to the rapid evolution of these events, um, these, they will only appear uh, in one to two data points per event in the wide fast deep. Um, so how can we do flare science um, when these uh, events are only detected in one to two images? Um, so our idea is that we can take advantage of a phenomenon called differential chromatic refraction. Uh, this is a apparent shift of a source location on the sky towards the zenith of the observer, which is dependent on the air mass, the source SED and filter. And because the SED shifts blueward during the flare, there is a small increase in the normal amount of DCR that we observe at quiescence. And so this uh, differential DCR or delta DCR, if we can uh, understand the, the relationship between uh, the temperature of the event and the delta DCR, we can infer the color temperature from uh, even just a single point detection. And the best case scenario is, is a really hot flare on a cold uh, photosphere of, uh, for example, an M dwarf um, that's observed at high air mass. Um, but can Rubin actually resolve this small astrometric offset? Um, so we, we did a simulation where we took a, uh, the SED, a template uh, SED of an M dwarf uh, from SDSS, and we add a black body on top of that to simulate a flare at varying different temperatures. Um, and then add those two SEDs together to simulate the quiescent M dwarf spectra in pink and then the flaring uh, spectra in blue in purple. Um, and then use those two SEDs to calculate the difference in refraction uh, of the source between quiescence and event. Um, so in this plot here, uh, I'm showing the amount of delta DCR as a function of Rubin filter and air mass. Um, and we see that for uh, in the G band, um, in, in this plot, blue represents a delta DCR that is greater than the minimum requirement on Rubin's absolute astrometric precision. Um, and we see that for G band, for half of all visits in wide fast deep, um, even this minimum requirement is sufficient to resolve the delta DCR produced by a 10,000 Kelvin flare. Um, but we actually, but it's actually better than that because we don't have to use the uh, absolute uh, astrometry, we can rely on uh, the uh, relative uh, 
astrometric requirements, um, which go down to a minimum requirement of just 20 million arc seconds. Um, and in, in addition, if we look at the distribution of per visit air masses um, across the Rubin footprint, this is a, uh, in, in one of the simulations of the survey strategy, um, we find that the uh, distribution of high air mass visits are, are well distributed across the footprint, um, which uh, is beneficial for our science case. Of course, the survey will prioritize low air mass visits uh, to maximize image quality, um, but there will still be um, a tail of air masses of, of visits at high air mass. Okay, so everything I've uh, mentioned up to up to this point uh, was published last month in the Astrophysical Journal Supplement Series, um, and uh, I have a QR code uh, at the end that you can uh, check out the paper. Um, but in the time I have left, I just want to mention some preliminary work that we've we've been doing on uh, validating this delta DCR method on Rubin precursors. And specifically, we're using data that was collected as part of the Deeper, Wider, Faster program, which is a program that coordinates uh, 80 observing facilities worldwide to do simultaneous multiband and multi-messenger observations of transients on millisecond to hour-long timescales. And one of the optical components of Deeper, Wider, Faster are high cadence continuous exposures with CTIO DECAM. Um, and due to the simultaneous nature of the program, those fields are observed at, higher, at high air mass um, above 1.45. Um, and Sarah Webb uh, published a paper uh, where they detected this extremely bright flare um, with DECAM, a six magnitude flare on an M7 dwarf. Um, the, and the air mass ranged from 1.45 to 1.75 uh, over the duration of the flare. And it was observed with a 50 second cadence. Okay, so I'm showing the light curve of the flare on the left here, and over here is the image of the source uh, on the DECAM chip um, with a zoomed in uh, view below. Um, and at each epoch of the event, what we are doing is basically drawing a little vector from the uh, reference position, which we choose to be the position of the source at the beginning of the uh, observation period and then measuring the projection of that vector in the direction of the zenith to quantify uh, DCR. Um, because remember, the refraction uh, is towards the zenith of the observer. And when we measure that projected uh, vector over the course of the, over the duration of the flare um, and compare it to the, uh, that vector, the same uh, projection for uh, a collection of reference stars in the same image, um, we find that the, uh, the curve in blue here uh, separates from the, uh, the, the curve for the reference stars uh, in gray. Um, and then when we look at the uh, tangential component of that vector, um, we find that it doesn't separate. So this is, a, uh, to, this is an indication that there is uh, delta DCR being produced uh, by the flare. Um, and then we also uh, take the residual between the flaring star and the reference stars and, and smooth it with a rolling median. Um, to extract a temperature um, profile. And the way we extract a temperature profile is we essentially forward model uh, the delta DCR uh, as a function of effective temperature and air mass, and at each epoch um, find uh, an effective temperature as a function of the zenith word projection of the offset and the uh, air mass at each epoch. Um, and to our knowledge, this is the first time that a flare temperature profile has ever been measured in this way. So um, it's pretty exciting. Um, yep, so I think that's all I wanna talk about and I'll take any questions, thanks. Thank you, Riley. Any question? Uh, for Ruben, do you have any idea how well you have to understand the chromatic distortion? So the astrometric, uh, chromatic effects on astrometry that are in the in the optics of the telescope. Do you mean like that, like chromatic seeing, or I actually don't. No, it's okay. it's an, it's one of, it's another effect. Okay. Where the position of the of the light will depend on on color. Okay. So it's a distortion. Um. So, in in our paper, we look at the effects of um the effects on the PSF of chromatic seeing and, and DCR. Yeah. Um, I don't think we've incorporated what you're referring to though. Come talk to me. Okay, let's yeah, talk. Come talk to me. Thank you for the talk. Just stop. <laughs>
pre curiosity. Do you think that this delta DCR method might be applied also to other scientific cases, like to peak flares, noisy environments? Well, noisy is related to the fact that the source might be variable itself, like between a flare or an EGN on top of the typical red noise like the uh, yeah, so I think the reason we chose we chose flares as a case study because they uh, can't really be studied in any other way in Rubin uh, due to just the the, the, cadence, the nature of the cadence. Um, but yeah, I think one of the other science cases that we've considered uh, as um, would be like a like an R or Lyra pulsating variable. Um, but I think in principle, yeah, any any um, uh, chromatic transient um, could be uh, could be studied in this way. I can follow up. Uh, can that be applied to supernovae or is the difference in temperature not large enough for this, this effect to work? Uh, so I think with supernova, because, the, because the, the events evolve over such a longer time scale, I mean, I think maybe there are better ways to study supernova um, that, that uh, you know, because we don't, we don't have this uh, problem of the, uh, of the cadence. Um, but I'm sure it could still be attempted. Um, yes. Um, do you know, have you investigated the minimum time sampling that you would want? When, what's the optimal time sampling that you're gonna get with Ruben? Because in the data set you showed there was a high sampling, you could see the rise yeah. and the decay. Yeah. What's the minimum you would need from Ruben to be able to do this? Um, so, so is, it, is low and high good enough? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So likely in wide fast in wide fast deep, we'll we'll get you know one to two data points. So that's going to be um, you know, catching the catching. You'll get a temperature measurement near the peak, likely because in essence, if uh, if, if you only get one photometric measurement, you can draw a series of flare templates that pass through that measurement, and most of them will be close to the peak brightness of the flare. So you get one. One measurement at peak, um, and then maybe one if it's thirty minutes later, if the if, if the flare evolves on a long enough time scale. Um, but but in, in the deep drilling fields, I think it's 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 three minute uh, separation between uh, same filter observations, um, and so uh, so so th so that'll be a lot better. But there's just not as many flares. And but you're happens. most likely to catch it at the peak. So yeah, okay, cool. Let's thank Riley again. And as always, I encourage everyone to post their additional questions on the Slack channel. A couple of questions on the chat. Okay. Just now, sorry. <laughs> So the last speaker of the session is uh, Charlotte Ward, who will tell us about Scarlet 2 and how to do multi-resolution scene modeling for transient photometry and post-galaxy characterization. Take it away. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a postdoc in the Astro Data Lab uh, at Princeton University. Um, and I'll be talking about a new software package called Scarlet 2, which has been developed um, in our group at Princeton. Um, and in particular, I'm hoping to sort of get feedback and ideas um, afterwards. Please come chat to me about how we can make this software most useful for anyone who is studying extragalactic transients and interested in a number of the applications <laughs> that I mentioned. Okay, so this is an extension of techniques that uh, have been developed uh, to combine multi-resolution imaging data to deal with crowded fields. So this plot shows an SVSS image on the left uh, as we go deeper, a decals image. And then as we go to LSST-like depths here, um, this is an HSC image. Um, as we go to, to um, deeper imaging, we have more problems with uh, galaxies that are blended with other galaxies. And this makes it harder to extract the um, SEDs and the morphologies of those galaxies because we need to figure out where to assign flocks uh, in these overlapped regions. This really motivates uh, the incorporation of space-based imaging where we have a much higher resolution that can help us with this deep blending problem. If you're interested in transients, we also need to think a little bit about these crowded fields and what that means for uh, you know, determining the uh, correct host galaxies of transients, um, as well as measuring um, 
you know, photo Zs from correct SEDs uh, in these busy fields. Um, so Scarlet uh, is actually something that some of you may have used if you've uh, you know, opened the LSST cloud and run any of the Jupyter notebooks where you do source detection and then you run the deep blending to decide you know, how many uh, galaxies are actually in this blob. Um, and um, it was originally developed to be able to combine multi-resolution data sets so we can see some ground-based imaging at the top and space-based imaging at the bottom um, to help uh, you know, come up with source models. Um, so we are currently uh, working uh, in our group on Scarlet 2, um, which is a new version of Scarlet 1, which uses JAX to run on GPUs, um, and in particular takes a slightly different approach uh, to uh, modeling galaxy morphologies. In particular, we use um, data-driven priors on galaxy morphologies, where we have a score-based neural network developed by Matt Sampson, a grad student at Princeton, and this helps us uh, to come up with good galaxy models in difficult cases. Maybe it's a highly blended um, situation. Maybe we have low signal to noise data. Maybe we have a very rough initialization and we, but we want to um, guide the, the um, gradient descent to a good uh, galaxy model. Um, so we apply these galaxy priors to help in these uh, various um, situations. Um, we're also able to do MCMC sampling in pixel space, which means that we can um, you know, get accurate posteriors on parameters such as host galaxy morphologies, transient positions, and whatnot. Um, and I wanted to uh, point you to Benjamin Remy, who has been working on the multi-resolution uh, renderer. And um, what his work has done uh, is that if you have any imaging data from any survey, it doesn't matter if it's aligned, if it has different pixel scales, you can combine it together and model it all simultaneously in Scala 2. Um, and yes, I have a feeling that would happen. This was a video showing that if you have a bad initialization, it still comes up with a good model in the end. Okay, so what does this mean for a time domain astronomy? Um, so I've been working on a time domain extension to Scarlet 2, which is not only able to use different SEDs and the galaxy morphology prize to come up with good deep blending um, uh, solutions, uh, but it is also able to use constraints on whether you have a variable point source and a static host galaxy in order to come up with the best uh, models of transients and their host galaxies and the other background galaxies. Um, so we need to have a non-parametric galaxy modeling approach if we want to use scene modeling to come up with good transient photometry and um, scene models. Um, because if you enforce, say, like a Sursage profile, but it's not quite right, that will ultimately mean that you have um, seeing dependent effects when you're trying to uh, extract good transient photometry. So that's why we need to have these non-parametric galaxy models and the priors to involve them. Um, so there are a number of different applications that I have in mind for this software, and this is where I'd love for people to come and talk to me afterwards if they have other ideas. Um, so just some examples of where you could use this. Let's say you have um, data from two different surveys, maybe it's LSST and LS4, and in your reference image, the transient um, you know, has a different flux because it was taken at a different time. And those templates also have different seeing, you know, different, the surveys might have different limiting magnitudes, pixel scales, but you just want to put it all together and come up with a good light curve and a good model for the host galaxy. You can do that uh, with Scholar 2. Um, you might want to, for example, use the sampler to get posteriors on parameters such as the gal host galaxy SED or the, um, you know, the flux of the transient over time. So you can use the sampler to do the sampling. Um, you might have situations, for example, where the transient is always present. So you might have a variable AGN where you, know, you don't know what the, the baseline flux is because it's always there. Um, so you can use this uh, deep blending technique to determine the background host galaxy SED and the variable AGN SED. Um, and you, there are also situations where it might be helpful if you want to do force photometry of fate transients where you don't have a good sense of where the position is. Um, so these are just some examples. Um, so just to show some examples of it working. So we've done a number of tests on simulated supernova data to show that it can come up with good photometry and uh, correct host galaxy models regardless of whether you have pre-flare imaging or no pre-flare imaging. Um, you can apply constraints if you know when the transient is on or off, if you want to help Scarlet 2 out, but it doesn't need it. Um, so these are just showing the, the simulated data versus the actual data. Um, you can also use it to measure uh, transient host spatial offsets. Um, so uh, if you want to uh, classify a transient as nuclear or non-nuclear and get uh, use the MC, MC sampler to get a posterior and determine the certainty on this, um, you can use Scarlet 2. So here are our simulations where we show the measured offset versus simulated offset, and we're able to um, you know, extract these accurately. Um, so to show that it also works on real data with all of the messy complications it might have with you know, imaging artifacts and, and undersampled PSFs and whatnot, we've applied it to a few different surveys. Um, one case study is on Zwicky Transient Facility um, data 
of channel disruption events. So in CTF, we have one arc second pixels. Um, we have, uh, you know, some plenty of imaging that, you know, has a lot of uh, sort of artifacts and masked regions. Um, and in this case, we're interested in making sure that we can get accurate TDE photometry, that we can, um, you know, get accurate uh, uh, measurements of the position relative to ho the host galaxy nucleus to make sure it is indeed a nuclear transient. Um, and we are indeed able to uh, apply Scarlet 2 to the ZTF TDEs that can deal with the complicated galaxy morphologies um, and come up with accurate uh, galaxy morphology models and accurate photometry. As a second case study, uh, we looked at um, hypersubprime cam um, transient survey uh, imaging of variable AGN. There are about 500 variable AGN in the cosmos fields um, where they have uh, you know, nice HSC uh, light curves from difference imaging um, as well as nice spectroscopic follow-up. Um, so we went and modeled all of these with Scarlet 2 to um, extract their photometry. Um, we were able to show uh, that we were able to correctly extract the, um, the host galaxy SEDs uh, um, by comparing the um, Scarlet 2 deep blending results to um, spectroscopic analysis, where we instead modeled the AGN and host galaxy spectrum. And we were able to show that, um, you know, the Scarlet 2 imaging only based uh, extraction of the, the galaxy SED was correct when compared to the spectroscopic uh, decomposition. Um, we're also able to sort of do a pilot study of what we might want to do in the future uh, in LSST. If you're interested in looking for wandering black holes from recoil events or uh, triple interactions or mergers, um, to sort of look at what kind of uncertainties we could get for large scale searches of offset AGN. And we're able to find that, you know, about sort of uh, uh, greater than um, 0.2 arc seconds, we're able to detect uh, three sigma um, significant um, offsets. Um, and with this sample, which has all this nice spectroscopic um, analysis, we're able to do a preliminary study of, of how this de uh, depends on mass for comparison to cosmological simulations. Um, we also have in mind a few other potential future applications for the software. Um, one is dealing with these marginally resolved, strongly lensed transients. Um, so because you can uh, give Scholar to a custom prior, we're looking at um, you know, creating a prior for what lensed galaxy shapes might look like and using that to help to de-blend multiple image systems where we can model the, the variable point sources, the lensing galaxy and the host galaxy and extract the SEDs for these systems. This is one of the next things that we're hoping to do. So in summary, um, we've developed a, a time domain extension of Scarlet 2, which can combine multi-resolution data, model both transients and host galaxies. Um, and we're hoping to apply it uh, to a, a range of different transients. Um, you can check out the Scarlet 2 code if you look up these slides on the website. And I've made some example um, notebooks for time domain applications, uh, the ones that I mentioned here. Um, if you have another application that you're interested in, I can add it to the, the suite of notebooks we're currently developing the documentation now. Um, and uh, yeah, please come chat to me if you have any suggestions or feedback. Cisco? Yes, sorry. So, so I was wondering, in, in this console, you will use it for the SSD. And uh, the measurements GPU compatible. will help us. Is it, is it run, let's say, Right, right. Um, yeah, so it scales with uh, the number of epochs you have in the imaging. So it scales, uh, it can model large images with many sources very fast. So, you know, take a few seconds to, to come up with a, a scene model. Um, but if you if you want to say model like thousands of epochs, then it's at the moment, it's only fast enough to do that on kind of a single source basis. So, um, so uh, at the moment, the way I'm kind of imagining it is you have your difference imaging, to tell you where the supernovae are, and then any sources where you really need to get sort of this accurate, some, some kind of careful analysis, you would then run them on a case-by-case -case basis. Having said that, I think if, if someone with more pipeline experience than me actually had a go at it, it would be it would be possible to scale it up. Um, thank you, that was really great. Um, you mentioned that uh, Scarlet 2 can be used to combine photo battery. So, um, can this be used for transfer learning? Because like one issue that popped up in the ML session yesterday was that we have ZTF, which is great, but a lot of algorithms trained on ZTF won't really work on LSST. And so can you see this being helpful in that sense? Yeah, so, so the way that this could be useful is that um, for all of this kind of class of scene modeling um, uh, uh, programs, we, we have a, a model, you know, like the source parameters, and then we render it to look like the image, the observations that we have based on the information it has about those observations. So let's say you have your LSST images, you develop a model for the sources and the images based on the fitting of the LSST images, you can then render them to look like a ZTF image or the other way around. 
um, to see what it looks like when rendered to those observations. So you can very easily, you know, fit models to one set of survey data and then translate them to look like the other survey. Um, so that's all built in and, and very, very easy to do with this. Brilliant question. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think our time is up. Let's uh, thank uh, Charlotte again. Everyone for the great turnout. Uh, let's meet for whoever is interested for the second part of this TVS session at 3.30. Uh, Melissa, do we have any announcements for now? Not very now. So free to go. Great. Thank you, everyone.